namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasam buddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Olahudi Samyao Sanputoshe. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Olahudi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gawai Shishung, Dajia Omitofo. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our sutra lecture this afternoon, this evening. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, the 1st of August here in Queensland, Australia. It's the last day of July in California and other places around the planet. We're joining in a, thanks to technology, a global community of sutra investigators, sutra listeners. And what we're gonna do today is we're going to look into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hua Jing, the Avatamsaka Sutra. We're closing in on the very, very last words of the 10 stages chapter, the Dashabhumi, the 10 transferences chapter, which is the chapter that talks about bodhisattvas. Mm, the whole sutra does indeed talk about bodhisattvas, but this is the instruction manual for, for how bodhisattvas think, how they behave, how they respond, uh, how they speak. And we've been going uh, in depth dive into the Flower Garland Sutra. And um, I should say that uh, uh, how grateful I am for the, uh, the kind hearted, mm, enthusiastic assistance that volunteers provide to make this happen, to make this go out to the world, not only putting it on Zoom, which is where I'm speaking from, but then porting it over to YouTube, where many of you are watching, and in the process, translating it into Vietnamese, and also translating it into China, porting it over to other apps, uh, other channels, so that friends in China can hear a Mandarin translation. How lucky am I, right, to be able to uh, have my, my words extend uh, into other cultures, other languages, other consciousnesses. So uh, that's what we're about. Um, appreciate all the volunteers who week after week just uh, come together to make this happen. So uh, with that in mind, let's get right to our text. We're gonna come back to page 96. But before we do that, we're going up to the top where we have, what is this? This is the title of the sutra and it's also an invocation. So um, when I did a pilgrimage at one point uh, focused on the Flower Garland Sutra, every time I bowed uh, every three steps, this is what I recited. Um, this was the, um, the wish that I had that, the, uh, that I could express my respect to the Flower Garland Sutra of Great Expanded Teachings and the Oceanwide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who are responsible for, for bringing this uh, into, into our awareness here in our time and our planet. to a melody. We do it in Chinese. You're welcome to join if you care to. You can put your palms together and try out these Mandarin sounds to the sound of the banjo. Namo da
made banjo with nylon strings on it, uh, giving it a new voice. And allowing us to welcome the Flower Garland Assembly here into our culture, into our time, and showing our respect for the wisdom that they share with us. And let me remind folks where we left off last week. Uh, just as a tease, you ready to tease here? To show you where we are, where we are in relation to, to the end, there. We're here, we have one more page to go, and we're done with the entire chapter, the Shirdipin. We've been going at it for six years, my goodness. And... Our speaker, whose name is Vajra Treasury, Bodhisattva Chingangzang, he has been uh, re repeating the instructions he gave earlier, only doing it in verse form. He's been basically chanting them in poetic form, metered form. And he, uh, two weeks ago, said, that's it, I'm done. What you've heard is just a summary, one drop in the ocean of all that can be taught. And then he said, the 10 stages are like kings of mountains, mountain kings. Just out of the blue, he introduced that analogy and he named them in typical flower garland sutra style. He did 10 mountain king names and 10 shanwang uh, and the names are in Sanskrit, and some of them are translated, some are transliterated. Uh, so we get like Shishan, and it's Himalaya, and the Himalaya, 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 people say it different ways. The Himalayas are snowy mountains, the snow-capped mountains. So uh, that was the first one. And those mountains are totally in our human geography. They're out there. Mount Everest is among the Himal Himalayas. K2 is among the Himalayas, right? And then he went on to name nine others, and we did two or three last week. We're going to start over just to, uh, to get the whole sequence, and we'll do, let's do five today, and then I'm going to go to um, some research that I did about those ten mountains, and then talk about mountains in general. But the point that struck me as I was preparing for this was how interesting that um, the sutra's over, he, the chapter's finished, he's already said what he needed to say, and then he goes into this riff on 10 kings of mountains. And he later uh, compares them, one mountain, one stage, one mountain, second mountain, second stage, etc. So it's a, it seems like uh, a, an afterthought, or it seems like an account, uh, anticlimax a bit, but this is not the only time that we've seen this. For example, the Medicine Buddha Sutra, the Sutra of the Past Vows of Vaidurya Raj Prabhasa, right? The, the Buddha of Limitless Light, uh, the Buddha, oh, I'm sorry, said it wrong. This is the Buddha of lapis lazuli light. Limitless light is Amitabha, but Medicine Buddha, Yao Shifu, he, his sutra is over, and then he launches into a story about Yaksha king, Ye Chawang, and these uh, Bodhisattva Yaksha kings who have made vows to, uh, to help Medicine Buddha. And oh, there they are, and there's a list of is it 10 or 12, 12 I think. And, they have a special dharma and they have their names and, and it's like, huh, okay, sure. 
Uh, it's, it's good to know uh, the lore of the Dharma. But in any case, uh, that's what we are today, is after we've heard about the 10 stages, we get to hear about 10 kings of mountains and how they, like mountains, they stick up prominently on the horizon and catch our attention and uh, create all these wonderful things that benefit the lives of human beings who live at the base of the mountains and the valleys or on the mountain sides or for those hardy souls on the peak of the mountain. So, okay, that's where we are. And that's this kind of funny but kind of cool at the same time that we get to learn about these, these mountains, kings of mountains. Okay, so we're going to uh, start again where we left off we're going to repeat last week's just to do the whole series. It's only a matter of verses. Okay? So, we are here today. We'll start with this one. I'm going to put my palms together. And what You're welcome to join me if you care to. I'll give you a line chanted in melody, and you can give it back if you care to. Here we go. Sidi wo jin yi lue shuo. Sidi wo jin yi lue shuo. Okay. Now I have presented a summary of this stage. Now I have presented a summary of this stage. Were I to speak in detail, I could never finish. Were I to speak in detail, I could never finish. All stages such as these within the Buddha's knowledge, all stages such as these within the Buddha's knowledge are like ten kings of mountains majestically abiding. I like ten kings of mountains majestically abiding. Okay, summary of this tenth stage. If I were to try to tell you everything about it, I couldn't finish. It's just too vast. Uh, and all of the stages that we've heard about from one to ten are, by analogy, like ten kings of mountains that abide majestically. How does it go? It's a uh, you know, very uh, grand and imposing and the biggest things. Mountains are the biggest, the biggest part of the earth. Are these. It's not flat, it's like that. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in around uh, from born in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, then moved to Toledo, which is, we say the Midwest. It's not the Midwest, it's the Great Lakes states. Midwest would be like west of Illinois, right? But it's the Mideast kind of. Anyway, it's flat there. It's really flat. Toledo is super, super flat. A glacier went through and made it all flat. And, you know, you can, the tallest things are the grain silos and the telephone poles. And the closest thing to any mountains are something called the Irish Hills, which are about 30 miles north into Michigan, which aren't, as far as hills go, they're kind of puny. So I had never, never seen mountains until I traveled back to my father's, uh, father's homeland, which is New England, and uh, the uh, Laurentian Shield of Quebec, the La Belle Provence de Quebec, which is French Canada. And sure enough, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Maine, Canada, there are mountains. There's this, the Appalachians, the northern part of the Appalachians, which becomes the Green Mountains, the White Mountains, and the Laurentian Shield. So I saw mountains. It was like, mountains are wonderful. They, they go up and they go down, and all these things grow on mountains. Wonderful. I remember walking uh, over the Green Mountains outside of Middlebury, Vermont, and finding blueberries, wild blueberries on the mountain. And we were in season and oh, the bears loved those blueberries. And you know, things that bears love are usually sweet. So we picked our own wild blueberries 
on the Green Mountains. I think it was Mount Musilak outside of Middlebury, Vermont. And wow, nothing like that in Toledo. Uh, so I uh, first encountered the Appalachians. And then later, um, had a chance to go to see the Rockies in Colorado and then went on to the Sierras in California and the, the Cascades, oh my goodness, uh, in northwestern Washington and encountered mountains and realized that uh, the planet has uh, wonders beyond the, the flat, fertile, black soil of northwestern Ohio, uh, really good for growing things. It used to be a lake bottom right? Lake Erie. But when you see a mountain, oh, you look up. There's a mountain top. Wow. It's different, really different. So to compare the, the planet's tall places with the 10 stages, yeah, works. Here we go. Oh, wait, before we start, before we start, I realize I only gave, if that was an analogy, I only gave half. Why are the 10 stages equal to those beautiful high places on the planet Earth? It's because among people, a bodhisattva is that same kind of awesome, majestic. You, when you find out how unselfish people can be, how they can truly live for others and uh, benefit they just, they just give through generosity and service and kind words and collaboration and compassion. Um, you discover that, that among humans, they stand out that same way, right? A bodhisattva is like a mountain. Just it's, you, it's, it's taller. And uh, lots of wonderful things grow on the slopes of a bodhisattva's kindness and compassion that nurtures living beings, right? So that's the other side of that analogy. So, okay, here we go. Let's dive into the mountains that Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva wants us to recall. Okay, ready? Chudi iye buke jin Chudi iye buke jin Piru shi shan ji zhong yao Piru Xie Shan Qi Zhong Yao Ardi Jie Wen Ru Xiang Shan Ardi Jie Wen Ru Xiang Shan San Ru Bi Tuo Fa Miao Hua Chan Ru Bi Tuo Fa Miao Hua Good. Next. The first stages, actions, and skills are endless. The first stations, first, sorry, my mistake, one more time. The first stages, actions, and skills are endless. First station, actions, and skills are endless. The way that snowy mountain holds multitudes of herbs. The way that snowy mountain holds multitudes of herbs. Stage two's precepts and learning are like fragrance mountain. Stage two's precepts and learning like fragrance mountain. Three is like Vaidari's making wondrous blooms. Three is like Vaidari's making wondrous blooms. Okay. Uh, first stage, actions and skills are endless. That's the first stage Bodhisattva who makes vows. So the heart of that first stage is vows that Bodhisattva make. It's the stage of happiness. Oh so happy to be liberated and uh, to be able to help finally and really know that they're helping and they can do it skillfully so um, the analogy to how that first stage bodhisattva's actions and skills are endless is the Himalayas Sheshan snowy mountains when you get to the snowy mountains what you discover is interestingly unexpectedly valleys it's not just a like a skyscraper, straight up. No, it's up and down, hills, hills, valleys, hills, valleys. Then you get to the base and then up you go. But there's lots of, uh, a mountain is not this narrow. Mountains are wide. And to get up to the top, you have to go over all the wide parts, which are valleys. 
And the Himalayas have lots of lush, not tropical, but uh, temperate climates that grow incredible herbs, things that only grow there. And that when they, when a skillful and wise physician uh, learns from the past, learns from his teachers or her teachers, and applies it to current people, they discover, oh, this will cure illness. This is medicine, right? So the, uh, the, our Chinese doctors, friends here on the Gold Coast, uh, tell us that herbal physicians, traditional healers who use uh, plants as their, as their medicines, are very, 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 add more varies, very concerned about climate change because the, if the temperature changes and the glaciers, for example, uh, melt, if when you get to the higher altitude it's hot, those herbs are going to go away. And along with those herbs will be 5,000 years of learning and lore and teachings about herbal medicine. Um, Chinese herbal medicine, for example, and you could include Ayurveda, Indian herbal medicine, and all of the indigenous herbal medicines. The Chinese is the one that, that uh, we have friends who are skilled in Chinese medicine, and they base their, uh, they base their skills, their ability to concoct a formula that they know will heal this illness. They base it on things like Ban Cao Gang, the uh, uh, index of herbal medicines, and the Huang Di Nei Jing Su, and the Yellow Emperor's classic of of uh, healing, of the internal, uh, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine. So, those are texts that have been in Chinese culture for thousands of years, no exaggeration, and because our climate has been steady and stable all those thousands of years. So the formulas that were uh, passed on in Chinese medical culture for thousands of years in these texts still work. They're great. It tells you about what, you know, gansao, what is licorice. Licorice is a foundation for many other medicines. It is sweet, it is neutral, it uh, benefits digestion, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a, a added to many, many kinds of formulas to make them more palatable, and it balances out excesses and deficiencies. So what happens when you can't get licorice anymore? Because the water that used to feed it is now dry, or it only grows in a certain temperature range and now it's just too hot. We're going to have to adapt to a future with uh, where medicine medicine is will change the way we know it, right? So this is snowy mountain that holds multitudes of herbs. The consequences of climate change on on and what they're calling it climate disruption uh, is going to be catastrophic for for our ability to heal our heal our ills, heal our illnesses from the earth. Okay, so uh, I'm p sounding an alarm, but the people I know who know what they're talking about are alarmed. Uh, they don't know where those herbs are going to come from once the, they don't grow where they have always grown as long as the planet has been working with us. Stage two's precepts and learning are like Fragrance Mountain. Stage two is the second, that's the Wu Go Di. Hmm. Li Go Di, the stage going beyond defilement, transcending defilement, leaving defilement behind, talks about the 10 goods and the 10 evils. Remember how that, how that went? Um, and uh, precepts and learning. What's it like? It's like Xiang Shan, Xiang Shan Fragrance Mountain, Incense Mountain, uh, which is a mountain that is, has all kinds of fragrances. So, where 
does incense come from? I, I was just thinking the other day, it was early morning, I was making an offering to Guanyin Bodhisattva in where I live. And I remembered there was a, I, I have to lean down to pick up uh, the, the fragrance and uh, the, the box of incense. And one of, the, one of the scents, one of the fragrances that hit my nose reminded me suddenly I was back in the first time I ever smelled incense. <laughs> and it was a funny memory, um, kind of humorous. I was raised Methodist, not Catholic. And if you were raised Roman Catholic, every time you set foot in the church, by and large, you would smell frankincense and myrrh. The, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, Catholic liturgies and ceremonies require incense, and they have special swinging censers, and they put the incense in the, they have a, a circular piece of charcoal, and they light the charcoal, and then the incense is not a stick or not a cone. It's, uh, if it's frankincense, it's, crist it's um, like, like crystals. It's coagulated. It's uh, little myrtles of, of semi-transparent, uh, like, um, what's it like? If you've, if you've seen ambergris, or if you see where sap on a tree coagulates, right, it's like that. And so that you toss a couple beads of the incense coagulated resin, resinist, right? toss it onto the burning charcoal and it whoosh, up comes this cloud of smoke. And so the altar boys put it in the swinging little chamber on the end of a chain and swing it down the aisles of the cathedral or the church. Well, I never smelled that as a kid. We didn't do that in the Methodist church. I guess that was considered something that you, you wanted to leave behind uh, when you became a Protestant, when you protested. So we didn't grow up with incense. My first experience of smelling incense was, <laughs> it was in Detroit uh, in a head shop. What's a head shop? A head shop was something that grew up with a uh, psychedelic culture in the 60s in America. Um, I, I, I chuckle because I remember how awesome it was. Um, there was, along with um, the, the new, the rise of uh, the use of substances, right? Tune in, turn on, drop out uh, with LSD and, and uh, the other things that people were experimenting with along with the, the use of those drugs, uh, which were indeed illegal uh, at the time, uh, came a culture that included clothing, growing your hair long, uh, growing your facial hair long, and discovering things like black lights on posters, and uh, the music that went along with it, you know, I, uh, I need to edit myself here. I remember walking in, it was on, where was it in Detroit? I forget the, the neighborhood, but it was the hippie neighborhood. And I walked into a head shop and there was this thick incense cloud in the shop. And so, I remember it struck, struck me so, uh, I was, I must have been 15 at the time, I guess. And I was raised middle everything, middle American, normal, normal, you know, white bread and mayonnaise and peanut butter and jelly. And to step into a head shop, it was as if I had suddenly transported myself out of Detroit, Michigan and into a bazaar in Marrakesh or perhaps in uh, a neighborhood in Kathmandu. Uh, and <laughs> I remember to this day. So just last week as I was lighting incense, I smelled a, just a touch of that. And uh, I was like, there I am. I was back in the head shop in, in Detroit. And uh, so 
just the, the drama for me that was exotic. And it was, it was far out, man, and trippy, dude, and all the things that we, the language that comes with it as a new as counterculture arises. Um, and everything that came to Michigan was like months or years behind what was happening in the West Coast, San Francisco and LA, in the East Coast, in New York and Boston, uh, and then Chicago probably so. So this was my first encounter with anything like fragrance. I had no idea at the time that my future was going to be uh, at three times a day minimum. I was going to be responsible for lighting a stick of incense, placing it in front of the censer, in the censer in front of the Buddha, and bowing and chanting. I was going to be the one lighting incense and that my clothes are going to be perfumed with incense day in and day out. People set foot inside the Berkeley Monastery and they go, oh, it smells so nice in here. What are we smelling? You know, well, they're smelling three ceremonies worth of incense every day. And one of the <coughs> accumulated over 26, 27 years. One of the uh, skillful parts of Chinese incense, the incense in the Chinese culture tradition, is light fragrance, sandalwood. Not like the heavy, thick clouds of incense that were burning in uh, Detroit in the head shop. Um, Chinese incense comes in sticks, usually, with uh, 60 in a bundle wrapped in plastic. And if it was a heavy, smothering fragrance, you couldn't stand it, right? So it usually is a lighter fragrance. And uh, this is commercial grade sandalwood. We, since then, uh, at Dharma Realm Buddhist University, have, you, you can tell when Buddhism has actually arrived in a culture because the allied arts that surround the faith, the practices, the beliefs, the philosophies, if you will, uh, the allied arts that support the teachings spontaneously arise. For example, music is an example. Another would be food is an example. Art is an example. But American Buddhist incense is doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, several individuals at Dharma Ram Buddhist University, a uh, student who then went on to become a staff administrator, Kenny, uh, our friend Kenny, who has uh, taken, he uses ingredients from North America, from the mountains of the United States, and combines them with traditional incense fabrication, incense making, and produces brand new Western incenses native to North America. So this is uh, uh, something that, that is exciting to watch happen organically, spontaneously, because it's it's a sign that uh, the, the culture is here to stay. And organically, the, when the, the environment around the, the, the Dharma starts to interact with the principles of the Dharma, indeed, uh, we've got a brand new Western Buddhism. So my uh, scent, smell, is really key to our memories. Why is that? Well, it, some people say because the nose is closest to the brain of the various senses. Uh, the, it's closer than the eyes, in a way. Uh, the scents go directly into the nerves, that, the olfactory nerves that the, the brain discriminates. The nose, and, the nose scent, and nose consciousness. Uh, are, are key to memories, and there is Psycho psychologists, psycho 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 psychological theorists, theoretical psychologists, there we go, theoretical psychologists, who will tell you that 
scent is more powerful than vision in actually stimulating memory. That if we smell so, uh, fragrance that we have associated as we grew up with some experience, that it brings it back more vividly. So we don't know about that, maybe so. Wonder what you all think. Stage two's precepts and learning are like Fragrance Mountain where fragrance, fragrances emerge, right? Where the materials for making incense, that's why it's called Incense Fragrance Mountain, where they come from. Three is like Vaidari's, making wondrous blooms, flowers. Four people who grew up like I did in flat landscape on the plains, right? Um, America has incredible plains, great plains. Think of the states west of the Mississippi, right? Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas. Uh, those are states where um, grasses are the tallest things. Uh, and they go forever and they roll and there's even though it is not mountains and you can't say oh look there's mountain so and so I recognize that we know that mountain the absence of the mountains creates the plains and there is a incredible you go pingyuan huh should be pingyuan pingyuan yeah they uh, plains have an, a culture and an identity and a a jingjie, a state of their own that is majestic and uh, is there are uh, people in North America I know North America now who are uh, celebrating the, the culture of the plains and all of the different uh, special ecosystems that emerge from that so if you grew up in West Virginia you're a mountain person if you grew up in Kentucky you're a mountain person Right. If you grew up in uh, North Carolina, chances are you know the Smoky Mountains and you know the Blue Ridge and all these wonderful mountain systems along the eastern side of North America. But there are uh, folks who have never, ever seen mountains. And maybe people like that, the closest mountains, the closest you got to mountains, may have been the hills are alive with the sound of music Edelweiss, Edelweiss every morning you greet me the sound of music that was th when that movie came out the sound of music oh my goodness it was everybody's it won all the awards it was everybody's favorite and the music stayed and stayed and it's sh it's shown endlessly on uh after midnight movie channels, right? You get to watch The Sound of Music starring Julie Andrews and others. So, of course, The Sound of Music is based in the mountains in Switzerland and Germany and the Alps in Europe, another mountain range, indeed. And the song is Edelweiss. Edelweiss are these little white flowers Snow cups, is that what they're called? Um, or maybe they're just called Edelweiss. They use the German word. And they are spectacularly beautiful when, they, when, it's the Edel, when it's the season, when they're in bloom. And people who have never actually physically seen a mountain, when they saw Sound of Music and saw these spectacularly beautiful, breathtakingly beautiful Alps scenery, maybe they said, ah, someday, I'm going to see mountains covered with flowers like Edelweiss blooming in the sound of music, right? The mountain that the sutra tells us about is Vaidari, Vaidari. Here we are. What about Vaidari? Here it is. Bitosh, Bitoli, Shanwang. Um, its meaning, the meaning of Vaidari, is many multiple sustainings, holding many things, zhong zhong shi, upholding lots of things. This mountain 
is made from pure, pure, essential jewels, treasures. It holds many kinds of treasures in this mountain. Just like the Bodhisattva on the third stage, the stage of emitting light, no matter whether it's dhyana samadhi, psychic abilities, or liberations, and any kind of dharmas like this, they are all They are all as valuable as the treasures held on Mount Vaidari. Okay? The blooms that the sutra praises. Got it? So, this is my research list of mountains. We're going to refer to and translate all of these as we go. So, that's it. It says, Vaidari makes wondrous blooms like Edelweiss on the, in the hills are alive with the sound of music. And Vaidari, which means holding lots of things, it holds jewels. You go to Mount Vaidari and you find Bay, wonderful, precious things. Um, sometimes treasures are in the mountain, not in the earth. You think of a mine, you go down, right? Well, the mountain, you go up. But as you go up, you can also go in, into caves, and you can unearth wonderful things, like blueberries on Mount Musalak in the Green Mountains in Vermont. Boy, I'll never forget those. Next set, ready? Launching forward, here we go. Yen Hui Di Bao Wu Yo Jin Yen Hui Dao Bao Wu Yo Jin Piru Xian Shan Ren Shan Zhu Piru Ren Shan Ren Shan Zhu Wu Di Shan Tung Ru Yo Qian Wu Di Shan Tung Ru Yo Qian Liu Ru Ma Er Ju Zhong Guo Liu Ru Ma Er Ju Zhong Guo Blazing Wisdom's Treasures of the Way are endless. Blazing Wisdom's Treasures of the Way are endless. Like Immortals Mountain is home to kind beings. Like Immortals Mountain is home to kind beings. The fifth stage's spiritual abilities are like Yugamdra, Yugamdara. Sorry, one more time. The fifth stage's spiritual abilities are like Yugamdara. The sixth resembles horse ear with its multitudes of fruits. The sixth resembles horse ear with its multitudes of fruits. We have, we did the first three, we have three more, four, five, and six. Blazing wisdoms, treasures of the way are endless. So that's the next one. Blazing wisdom is the name of the fourth stage, Yen Hui Di, the fourth stage, the stage of blazing wisdom. And it holds endless treasures of the way, just the way mountain number four that is called Shan Xian, Xian Shan, Shan, is home to kind beings. Now, we go directly to our explanation. Find it right out there. You go back. We find it right there. Okay, what is number four? This is interesting because among the ten, this is the only one that didn't give us a Sanskrit name. Don't know why. I couldn't find it. I looked for a Sanskrit for Shen Xian Shan, Shen Xian Shan Wang, tongue twister, Shen Xian Shan Wang. And what is it? Zi Shan Duo Shen Xian Ji Zhi. There are lots of Shen is spirit or God, Xian is, we used to say immortal. Um, what is our new translation? Uh, when the Sharangama Sutra came out, they retranslated. Um, maybe 
maybe somebody will type in. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for that. Immortal. For the time being, we'll call it immortal. So, a spiritual immortal lives, spiritual immortals live in the mountain known as spiritual immortal mountain king. This is an analogy to the fourth stage of blazing wisdom. Chao chu shi jian er da 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 This goes way beyond the mundane world. People who are here go way beyond the mundane world. And they, rishi, uh, rishi is, yes. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you a lot. So, um, rishi, that's a Sanskrit word for a seer, someone who has clairvoyance. And it's another translation for xian, can't think. There was a reason why they didn't continue calling it immortal. There was a, uh, this was the, the committee that, that retranslated the Sharangama Sutra in English over 10 years. And they really set benchmarks for, for new terms. So, Shen Xian, there's a mountain, the king of, king of mountains called spiritual immortal, spiritual rishi, and lots of those kind-hearted beings, as our sutra, live there. The analogy for this among the grounds, the stages, is Yan Hui Di, the stage of blazing wisdom. And it goes way beyond anything that the ordinary commercial world, the marketplace world, can know, and gains Da Zi Zai, massive self-mastery. You master of yourself. You are sovereign. You can do what you want when you get to the fourth stage. Remember the fourth stage? That was where uh, the Bodhisattva, in order to hear the Dharma, said I would give up my body over and over if I could hear one verse of Dharma that would help me refine my Bodhisattva practices. Why this kind of like sacrifice? Because this Bodhisattva at this point has tasted the flavor that comes when you can actually help people, when you know you're helping them, when you're not like, well, I think it might work, try this, you know, hope you feel better. You know, you know what to say, what to do, what to not to say, what to say, stop, don't do that, you know, how to, you know what, what to prescribe in terms of Dharma medicine to help people get over their problems. That is a special feeling. I'm sure physicians, when they actually cure someone, when they heal someone and they know they're better, that must be so satisfying, right? To realize that because of your intervention, what you prescribed worked and their, the pain is gone. Yeah, so bodhisattvas know that um, deeply and here, they have dots in eye. They know what to say, how to heal, how to teach. So that's the mountain called Shen Xian Shan, spiritual immortal. Psych yeah. mm. Shen is also the word for gods, plural. So it could be, you know, divine immortal. It could be divine Rishi mountain. Next, next, we have what? The fifth stage of spiritual abilities are like Yugamdara. Yugamdara, and Yugamdara, mountain king, king of mountains. What does it say about it? Pick it up here. Here it is. Yo uh, Chen The meaning of this is Shuang Chi, doubly, hold, doubly sustaining, twice the holding power. Zishan Yo Chun Bao So Cheng, also made up of precious, special, refined, pure, essential jewels and treasures. Zhu Ye Cha Wang, Zhu Jie Zhu Qi Zhong, Yaksha, ghost kings, live there. Bi Yu Nan Sheng Di Pu Sa, Zhi Ru Yi Shan Tong, Zhi Shan Qiao Zi Zai. Similarly to, alike, uh, analogous to, the fifth stage, which is called the stage of difficult conquest hard to beat, right, hard to conquer. The way it is, the way bodhisattvas on the fifth stage can use 
their self-mastery in being skillful and clever at their wish-fulfilling psychic power. Okay, get the Chinese grammar here. Wish-fulfilling psychic powers, skillful, clever self-mastery. String that together. So, the way mountain number five, yugam, yugam dara, that's a typo here, it's a G, an, an M, not a J. You, the way Yugamdara mountain allows the yaksha, the ghosts, to live there. <laughs> Somebody says, I think I'll pass, thank you. Let's not include that in our itinerary. Why do we want to go to Ghost Mountain? So, like that mountain where the ghost kings live and it's made of pure jewels, similarly, stage five of the Bodhisattva's path allow the Bodhisattvas to have tzudzai, special self-mastery, skill, power, with their clever use of psychic powers that fill the wishes of living beings. Okay, get this theme? See how it rolls out? We're, we're balancing, we're trying to keep things in line here. Ten mountains, ten stages, and how they relate. Why is Bajra Treasury Bodhisattva introducing mountain stories here to talk about the ten stages? Next, the sixth resembles horse ear with its multitudes of fruits. Funny, huh? Number six, Ma'ar Shanwang, Ashvakarna, it's called Ashvakarna. Mm, what was mountain? Giri Raja, Giri Raja, mountain king. Ashvakarna Giri Raja, Ma'ar Shanwang. This mountain is also, likewise, made up of precious, special, pure, refined treasures, yi sheng chan yi qie zhu guo, and it produces special fruits, fruit mountain. Bi yu xian qian di, just like the Bodhisattva on the stage of manifestation, zi yi ti qi zhu miao yong, who personally embodies the arising of incredible functions, abilities that arise, for teaching living beings so that they can realize the fruition of our hardship. So, people remember stage six. What was it about? It was about 12 links of conditioned arising and creation. How, if you can break your ignorance, if you break, put the light in and break through the darkness, you can see how everything is made starting with your own next thought. That was what was realized, and it's the 12 links of conditioned co-production, how everything comes from that. The bodhisattva there sees them and is free, is liberated. Right at that point, accomplishes nirvana. There's a nirvana. You leave pain of samsara right there. That's where you jump off the wheel of birth and death. No more troubles, no more worries, no more singing the blues for you. Furthermore, you can use that ability to teach living beings so that they can also get to that first stage of nirvana. Not too shabby. Yeah, I'll sign up. I like that. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. I'm um, going to take a little side trip at this point and take us to a mountain. There's a mountain I had the privilege of visiting when I was in China, 1989. It's called Zhongnanshan, and the end of the southern mountains is called Zhongnan. And Zhongnanshan is a famous mountain for Buddhist pilgrims and hermits. If you are a cultivator in China, maybe a Taoist, maybe a Buddhist, and you want to get away from the dust and the, the pollution of the world, you go to Zhongnanshan. Now, where is Zhongnanshan? It's 50 kilometers south of Xi'an. Xi'an is the current name for what used to be called Chang'an, and what about Chang'an? 
It's the, the start of the Silk Road. It's the eastern end of the Silk Road. Uh, it's also where the terracotta warriors come from. So if people have, uh, in the last decade maybe, when, when travel to China became, it was a tourist destination for a while, not so much now, um, especially with COVID, but in the last 10 years, they discovered the, the terracotta warriors, right? Those incredible soldiers made of clay and the horses and chariots and all. That's outside of Xi'an. So much, much, much of Buddhist history uh, began and flourished in Xi'an. It's in Shanxi province. And Zhongnan Shan is just south. It's a range. It's not a mountain. You don't find a mountain in Zhongnan Shan. There is a peak, but it's surrounded by, uh, there's, it's about 60 kilometers of, of mountain ranges that stick out. So um, it's a favorite place for hermits and for Buddhist cultivation to flourish. So when I had the opportunity to visit Xi'an, there was a very kind uh, layman in the uh, tourist division of the party in Xi'an who was there to greet us and welcome us. And he took us uh, in a jeep as far as he could into the trailhead at Zhongnan Shan. And we got out of the jeep and Mr. Bai said, he said, uh, I know that you and, and your colleague here, uh, Hung Chao, have done a lot of walking, so I wasn't afraid to bring you here, but we have to walk from here on. He says, you okay with that? So we said, yeah, you bet. And he said, well, here's the trailhead. We said, where? He said, climb that boulder. So we climbed up on top of a boulder, and sure enough, you hopped from boulder to boulder because it was undeveloped. It was splendid. It hadn't been uh, made into a theme park, right? It was real. So we started boulder hopping uh, into the trail. We walked and walked, and it was... Uh, it looked similar to what you're seeing on the on my screen, on my desktop. This is not Chongnan Shan, by the way. What you're looking at is a mountain in Australia, down in Victoria, right? Uh, not too far from Melbourne. But in uh, the the trails on Chongnan Shan were full of uh, fragrance and insects and snakes and animals. They say there are leopards, bao shan bao, in Chongnan Shan and monkeys and all kinds of, I mean, it's, it's very, very fertile. Now, this was mm, 30 years ago, so uh, maybe it's been developed since then. I kind of think not. Uh, maybe somebody knows. But we, we traveled, and we, we were, our destination, he was going to take us to a mountain temple that was currently um, abandoned, and it was called Jingyesu. And Jing Ye Si was a monastery where Dao Shan Lu Shi, the, the Tang Dynasty monk who had compiled the Vinaya, worked and practiced. Jing Ye Si, pure karma monastery. So we got to Jing Ye Si, and we were greeted by some very young, uh, in their 20s, and even younger, um, monks in robes. And the thing that I noticed about these monks was they were very fit. They looked uh, rough and ready, rugged monks. They, they were, some of them had not taken the full precepts, they were too young, but they all were, they walked on, the, on their toes, you know, they kind of bounced when they walked. And Mr. Bai said, I want to introduce you to this bhikshu, and I won't mention his name. And he and his colleagues here only recently arrived from Shaolin Monastery. And it, we exchanged bows, and there were, I think, three bhikshus and maybe four or five novices, shamis. And they said, oh, you're Master Shrenhua, Wan Fo Sheng Cheng. Oh, we know, we know about Wan Fo Cheng. Uh, we've heard that it's a place where you can really cultivate. And so we're, oh, you know about us. He said, yeah, sure. And one of the monks, the, the one who was kind of the, uh, giving the orders, spoke English. And it was so strange because he spoke English with a British accent. 
he was only 22 years old. We said, how, where did you learn your, your English? He said, oh, I listened to the BBC, he said. <laughs> the BBC was allowed into China, and he was, he was at Shaolin Monastery, and it, when he had spare time, he turned on uh, the, the overseas BBC, had an English language program, and he says, oh, I learned that way. You really learned well. He says, yeah, I enjoy languages. Turns out, what's the story? They poured us tea, but there was no tea leaves available. They pulled leaves off the tree and picked them up out of the courtyard, and it was a fragrant tree, and it made incredible tea, but it was dried tree leaves, not tea tree, uh, but it's just fresh from the tree. Because why? They didn't have anything. These monks were poor, the, as only Buddhist monks can be poor, as only ascetics and renunciates, right? They had their bowls, they had their robes, and they didn't have a second spare. That was it. That was their, those are their shoes. And it was so interesting because the monastery was not repaired. It was, uh, it hadn't been, it had only been a few years since the Cultural Revolution, and it had been trashed during the Cultural Revolution. And it was, these monks were sent there to help hold the monastery down until the Buddhist Association could decide whether to rebuild it or not. What was the story? The story was the previous abbot of Qing Ye Si, who had been there through the Cultural Revolution and had suffered grievously, had been killed recently, murdered. By whom? Murdered by bandits. Who were the bandits who murdered the abbot of Jing Ye Si? They were bandits who came onto Zhongnan Shan to steal the bark of the trees and take it into Xi'an to sell as medicine. One of the qualities, as we've learned from our sutra about mountains, is their ability to produce herbs as well as flowers and treasures and fruits. So Zhongnan Shan was famous for producing medicinal materia, materia medica, right? The, the, raw, the raw materials that could be processed into medicine. And bandits, these thugs, came into the mountain and were stripping the trees of their bark, which is it's monastery land, monastery trees. It's one of the ways the monastery supports itself. And the abbot came out and challenged them, said, stop what you're doing, and they killed him. So now this, this didn't happen a lot. This was really, really rare that people would disrespect monks. But after the Cultural Revolution, when Red Guards and others were famous for struggling against the monks, they, probably they met somebody like that. So anyway, the abbot had died, and the Buddhist Association sent to Shaolin Si from Henan to please send out some monks who could hold the monastery down, who could protect things for a time being. Uh, they were not there to be, uh, not to you know, not in the line of succession to become the monk, the next abbots. They were just defending the monastery, and they thought if we send some Shaolin monks in, the uh, bandits won't dare to come back, because they'll be afraid that the monks will knock them down, beat them up. So it had worked. It had, it had worked so far. But we, uh, our group, our small group of travelers um, who were on a pilgrimage to the Four Holy Mountains, we were traveling to Wu Taishan. Our goal was to get to Wu Taishan, which is just not too much further uh, beyond uh, uh, Xi'an, same province. And we had, on our way to Wu Taishan, we stopped at Zhongnan Shan. So there we were, and we found a real affinity with these young Shaolin Buddhist monks. Were they Wu Sung, were they martial monks, or were they Fa Sung, Dharma monks? At the time, in the late 80s, uh, there weren't enough monks to make a difference. You were both. 
So the Dharma monks were trained in martial arts and the martial arts monks were also trained in sutra lecturing and such. So we connected with these guys and they said, oh, terrific, monks from America, from City of 10,000 Buddhas, come with us. So we set out from Jingye Si, uh, traveling, we went up, up behind the monastery climbing and steep, really steep. We went up this steep slope and uh, we were like, you know, now, and these young monks were, they were so fit. They were, they were martial monks and they could leap from, you know, boulder to boulder without even breathing hard. So we went up after them, got to this cave and it was a cave. If you look at um, the Buddha behind me, it was between the two lanterns on the altar here. That's how wide it was, just that wide. And maybe 10 feet deep. And we poked in and uh, the, the acting abbot, the, the monk who spoke English, waved us in. He said, look, look at this. And we looked, and here was a, a glazed tile. And he said, what's that? And we're like, oh, I said, I can read. And I read some characters off. He says, oh, you read Chinese? Yeah, a little bit. I said, read it. He said, what do you think this is? And I said, well, it's this stone that has been, it's, it wasn't a tile, it wasn't fired, it was a stone that had, had Chinese characters carved in it. He said, that is a Tang Dynasty Bei, inscribed by Wang Wei, having one of his poems inscribed. Wang Wei was the famous Tang Dynasty nature poet who was a Buddhist who came from that area and wrote about Zhong Nanshan. He said, that's the real one. He said, the, when the Red Guards came to destroy, they didn't find it. We covered it. We buried it. They didn't find it. They, we put some stuff in the front of the cave that they found. They smashed stuff that wasn't worth much, but this is the real Wang Wei Bei from the Tang Dynasty. And he said, can you read it? So we scraped it off and, and uh, we, we saw it. And he was, this, this monk was not at all into, I mean, he was a bhikshu. He wasn't trying to sell uh, a line of goods, you know, to make, to make the place more, more valuable. He wasn't. This is the real thing. So we're amazing, amazing. So uh, the, uh, the poem that I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the poem that was written there was Zhong Sui Po Hao Dao Wan Jia Nan Shan Chui Xing Lai Mei Du Wang Sheng Shi Kong Si Zhi Xing Dao Shui Chung Chu Zuo Kan Yun Chi Shi O Ran Chi Lin Sao Tan Xiao it's called Zhongnan Bie Ye, and this somebody else translated. I don't think, I don't think retreat is the right one. I think it's my Bie Ye is different from Gong Ye, right? My personal story of Zhongnan Shan. Something like that, or my personal, my life, my own life. Bie Ye is my, my own, my own life on Zhong Nan Shan, something like that. In midlife, I grew fond of the Buddhist way. Old now, I moved here among the southern mountains. On a solitary stroll, admiring the scenic beauty the myriad affairs vanished from my memory. Reaching the source of a bubbling spring, I sat to watch while the clouds emerged. Coming back, I ran into an old mountain man 
We talked and laughed. There was no longer any rush to leave. Right? What a flavor. What a flavor. So Wang Wei, in his, uh, he wrote, he, he left behind 400 poems. So this may, I don't remember if this was or was not the poem uh, on that stone stele. But this, the, the feeling, being old myself, I can really identify with this, this thought where he says, I, as a kid, I was, as a younger person, I was ambitious, right, to be a, uh, a scholar, and he was a poet and a, a painter and as well. But when he got, when he had some illness, he'd had some loss, he'd seen war, he decided that the Buddha Dharma was where it was at. And when he had the chance, he left Chang'an, went south, and moved in to a hermitage in Zhongnanshan. Nanshan is Zhongnanshan. And then he takes us out with him on a walk. He goes out to wander by himself, looking at the, the may here is a verb. The, to, it means beautiful, but it means to beauty, to beautify, to make beautiful the, the, the landscape. And bit by bit, the things that he used to concern himself with, all the worries of the world, just kind of vanish slowly, they're erased bit by bit. And here's, these two are really famous lines. These lines people uh, pull out of this poem and write on calligraphy scrolls and paintings. I walk to where the, the water emerged, where it was bubbling. We saw a spring right there on the mountainside. And I sat down beside it and the afternoon, the time passed and the clouds emerged and heading towards sunset. He decided to go back home, but he ran into a shan, zigenian o hashi so lin ta jiu shuo o ran zhi lin cou shi shen me o so he ran into an old guy, the old mountain man, a neighbor, but somebody who's deeper in the woods than, than Wang Wei. And what did they do? They just laughed and scratched, had a good time, and he's no longer got any reason to rush home, right? He's retired from the world. So beautiful, beautiful poem. And so there we were in the cave with an actual Tang Dynasty steel that had been in that cave maybe since Wang Wei himself uh, traveled to Jing Ye Si in the Tang Dynasty, you know, 1600 years earlier. So how cool was that? So we came out of the cave and the, uh, the monk said, now, he said, see up there? He points, look, see up there? We're, oh, yeah, there's a tall, one particularly tall, peak among the Zhongnan range there above Jing Ye Si. And he said, yeah, he said, so-and-so Bhikshuni is up there. And I, I forgot her name, but when I was in China not, uh, not long ago, I asked uh, one of our Dharma brothers in China, I said, hey, I, at Zhongnan Shan there was this famous Bhikshuni who was living on this tall peak. And he said, oh, you mean so-and-so Bhikshuni. Uh, that she's known, but the uh, there we were looking up at the peak, and he says, "Yeah, there's a bhikshuni up there." He said, uh, "During the Cultural Revolution, she got all her teeth knocked out. She was in jail, and they knocked all her teeth out, and her teeth grew back." He said, "She grew a second set of teeth, perfect teeth." He said, "She's an arhat. She will accept you if you can make it up there and stay." She'll explain the Jin Gang Jing. She says, it's so bitter up there, none of us can do it because it's too cold, <laughs> it's too high. Nothing, there's nothing up there. You just have to endure. But if you are willing, she's a nun, you have to keep your distance, but she will explain the Jin Gang Jing for you. And she said, we're, we're, we're hoping someday we can do it. You know. So yeah, that's the story of uh, stories on Zhong Nan Shan. Furthermore, we came back down. It was time for us to go. 
and we walked around Genius, uh, and there was a courtyard uh, where it's close to the, it wasn't actually, the courtyard is not, you think, in the middle. This is the entryway, and this is, mind you, steep. This is mountain, this is a mountain monastery. And so there's a f- flat place, and it had been a lot of rubble that had been really destroyed when the Red Guards came through. Um, but he said, the first week we arrived, and these, these monks had been there for a number of months, two or three months, protecting the place from the bandits. And he said, that first week when we arrived, he said, I was here with uh, my brother, and he mentioned the other monk, and the other monk nodded. And he said, we came down, and there was a huge, giant, da mang she. There was a python. And the python was curled around. His, his body was curled around one of the pillars here, around the base. And it raised its head, and it looked right at me and didn't move. He said, I was staring at this snake. He said, the snake was probably, he was 12, 15 feet long. The biggest snake I'd ever seen. He said it was bigger than my arm. Just, it was a huge snake. And its eyes didn't, didn't move. It just stared at me. And he said, the strange thing was, he says, as I was looking at it, I didn't feel myself in danger. I felt that I was being examined. The snake was looking at me. It was examining me. And he said, the monk said, I looked at the snake and I reported. Bao <laughs> Dao. He said, I, we have come to protect Jing Ye Su. Uh, we have heard the legend of Jing Ye Su that there is a Da Mang She Hu Fa who is protecting this monastery. They told us about you. If you are that snake, we want to express our respect. We will keep you safe. Please keep us safe. And he said, this is what I said, because we, we've been told that since the Tang Dynasty, there was said to be a Dharma protector at this temple that was a Shu Shan. It was a, a Moha Luo Qi, right? The, the Tianlong Babu, we learned about them uh, just a few weeks ago. The, uh, the last of the Tianlong Babu is Moha Luo Qi, the Mahoraga, Mahoraga, Da Mangsha. It's the last one of the Eightfold Pantheon of Dharma's protectors. Jing Ye Su has one. And it would appear to whoever was, had their hearts in the right place to protect the monastery, because that's the job of the, the python, of the big, some people call them boa, boa constrictors. I think it's probably a python. And he said the snake looked at him, listened to what he said, and uncurled and slid away. So, <laughs> you know, they, uh, we were like, oh, real, huh? He said, yeah, real, real snake. And uh, so we asked this uh, bhikshu about himself. And he said he had been a monk for 10 years. And he was drawn, at the time, it was really hard. There you couldn't, there, at the, during those times, becoming a monk was very difficult. During the Cultural Revolution, monasteries were under attack. But he said he, as soon as Shaolin Si opened, he went to Shaolin because he was young and strong. And he, they picked him out right away as somebody who could uh, who had leadership potential and trained him, but he said he uh, had been in a sparring contest at Shaolin Si with the other martial monks and had been injured, and injured sufficiently that he had to uh, pull away from thoughts of uh, becoming a, a martial arts master and he had to study instead. 
had to hit the books. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was when he decided to learn <coughs> English because he hoped to, he said he had wishes to carry the Dharma into the world. So how lucky were we to uh, run into these monks at Zhongnanshan? I've been told, uh, number one, that old Mr. Bai passed away, our, our guide from Xi'an, and that Jing Ye Si has been rebuilt and uh, gathered into the Fo Jiao Xie Hui, the Buddhist community, which it needed to be. It was, it was a ruin, but it's kind of sad because the, uh, uh, with modernization, you lose a lot of the original, uh, the traditional stories that, that are kept alive only through my mouth to your ears and your ears tip to the next generation, you know. So anyway, uh, when the Bodhisattva says, when Vajra Treasury says, um, the sixth stage resembles Horsier Mountain with its multitudes of fruits, um, mountains and the Dharma have always coexisted. They say in China, the best, the best mountains are owned by the Taoists and the Buddhists. They're, they're, all mountains are, <laughs> were uh, co-opted, you could say. They were owned, they were taken over by Buddhists and Taoists from the earliest times, because why? When you climb up off the plains, it's corresponding that you're climbing closer to your own nature. The higher you go, the higher you are to heaven, maybe, but the, what you see when you get up high is what we saw at Jing Ye Si and Zhong Nan Shan was that um, certain places on the planet inspire, inspire us, remind us of impermanence for one and you can see the connections you can see that we're getting older that the body is just like the seasons on the mountain there's a spring there's a summer there's an autumn there's a winter there's death and another spring so the inspiration to look deeply into this experience called human life is, is easy to come by on a mountain. It's everywhere around you. It's speaking that Dharma, that uh, don't wait until it's winter to start to cultivate. Because when the sap is coming from the roots up to the, the trunk and the branches and the leaves and the fruits through the flowers, that's when you want to use that energy to learn to learn the Dharma, and then uh, make the connections, understand that everything passes on. Don't wait until it's too late to cultivate the way. The lonely graves are filled with young people, says the Shifu's poem. Mo wang lao lai fang xiu dao, gu ji fen dou shi nian qing ren. How do you say? Gufan Dosh Shao Thank you. Yeah. I would be Cliff was he didn't scold me. He was polite. Sure who would scold me. You're gonna recite the poem, recite it correctly. Right? Indeed, indeed. So that's the next we have four more mountains to go. And next week I want to talk about mountains worldwide because sacred mountains around the world are not only Buddhists, right? Here is Mount Fuji. Here is Mount Everest. Here is Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Here is Machu Picchu in Peru, the Incas, right? Here is Uluru in Australia. 
Here is Mount Shasta in Northern California. Yes, Mount Kailash in Tibet. Mount Vesuvius in Italy. Mount Akka in Sweden, right? The Black Hills of South Dakota, North Dakota, the Badlands. So, yeah, Mount Olympus in Greece, Mount Ararat in Turkey, Armenia, Mount Fuji in Japan. These are Arunachala in India, right? Mount Tide in uh, Spain, Canary Islands. So the world celebrates its sacred peaks. And next week, we're going to finish Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva's list of 10 mountains and start to look at uh, moving the analogy between mountains and bodhisattvas into our hearts. What does that mean for us? What if you live on the fourth floor of an apartment building in a busy city street and you never see mountains? Well, the experience, it's still your consciousness, whether you're on flatland, urban landscapes, or on a mountain peak. How do we make the same awarenesses arise no matter where our bodies are? That's what we're gonna look into next week. And before we end, um, those of you who are locked down as we are here in Queensland, um, as of yesterday at 4 p.m., our premier um, told us to stay home because cases of Delta variant COVID-19 are on the rise here in Queensland, which is, hasn't happened yet. This is new. Um, hospitals in the United States are full. There's no more room in the ICUs, in the emergency rooms for patients who are coming in uh, hundreds by the day. So hard times coming. It's important to keep in mind that uh, if you, to raise our minds out of the current situation in front of us and remember that a year ago we didn't know about anything called COVID-19. And a year from now, who knows what kind of challenges will be in front of us. So keeping our mind on uh, the entire cycle. Better times, better times will come better times better times will come when this world learns to live as one oh better times will come ming tin ming tin wei gong ha ming tin ming tin wei gong ha shi jin he xie xing da tong when we greet each dawn without fear, knowing loved ones soon will be near. When the winds of war cannot blow anymore, oh, better times will come. Min dui kun hao bu wei Chin Pong Hao Yo Buli Bu Chi Dao Tsang Wu Ku Ma Fang Nan Shan Ming Tin Yi Ding Hui Gong Hao Better times, can you sing it with me? Better times will come, better times Better times will come When this world learns to live as one Oh, better times will come Though we live each day as our last We know someday soon it will pass We will dance, we will sing In that never-ending spring Oh, better times will come Sheng si zhuan shun yi xi zhi jian Hei an ye wan Bien
，明天一定会更好。Better times, better times will come. Better times, better times will come. Better times will come. Last chance. 明天，明天会更好。明天，明天会更好。世界和谐，心大通。明天一定会更好。Maybe so. All right.、Uh, it is time to ask the monks at the Berkeley Monastery to tell us what's going on. What's happening with y'all? Hey, I'm Yuto Fall. We have a number of changes because、mm -hmm. we're starting to go into another phase in Berkeley Monastery、uh, with young men coming here to cultivate, and also the upcoming fall semester. Nice. So we have on the top there. You see some changes to our virtual Buddha Hall schedule. We'll be shifting up our morning ceremony to four to five a.m. We've been doing it five to six a.m. to allow more people to participate,、uh, but we want to kind of keep our overall schedule in the monastery more consistent. So we're doing the four to five, and people who are joining at five, since we'll keep the recording online, you can definitely join us still and, and watch it you want. and play any time you want during the day. <laughs> so that's happening from four to five. 那么这么方便，哇！这么方便，对，在网上什么时候都可以 join in。但是在中国就比较需要一个早上，一个早、yeah. 一个小时早一点，因为 YouTube 在中国不能听。Yeah, you need to use more English. I was just playing that, so yeah. <laughs> so yes, it is convenient to be able to listen to morning ceremony any time you choose, but、uh, it's still hard here in Asia.、Uh, that that's a benefit for us here in Australia, because Uh, your 4 a.m. is, yeah. So continue, please. What else have we got? We have the also the、uh, the Dharma reflections in the morning and the three steps one bow. We'll be finishing on Friday, August six.、Um, so that will be ending. So if you want to catch the very end next week, that's going to be your your last chance until we we kind of think about a little bit more and see、mm -hmm. how else we want to continue.、Mm -hmm. um, but that will be happening next week, and then the rest of our programs stay the same in the afternoon. Afternoon recitation, twelve thirty to one, and our evening ceremony and mantra heart from six thirty to seven fifty p.m. I should add that. All right.、Um, then we also have a number of of events coming up. As people know, August is the month of Ulambana, and so we plan to have our online Ulambana ceremony on August twenty eighth, which is a Saturday, from six thirty to seven thirty a.m. So this is a chance to.、Uh, Recite the Ulambana Sutra and the mantra for repaying our parents' kindness.、Um, it's a chance to for us to make offerings to the monastery. This time, we can dedicate merit to our parents and former parents, wishing them well. So that's you'll see the information there. And the next one below, we also plan to have an Amitabha session.、Um, I don't know if you can scroll down there, Master. Um, you see there the week long Amitabha from August twenty eighth to the September third.、Um, it's the same schedule we've been doing online.、Uh, we found this to be a really good balance where it's not too much but also keeps people vigorous.、Um, so you'll see we'll start with the transmission of the eight precepts on August twenty eighth, Saturday morning, followed by the、um, actually that day because it's going to be Ulambana day. We plan to do the Ulambana ceremony. And then,、uh, oh wait, wait, sorry. That morning is Ulambana, and then afterwards we have the eight precepts, and then、uh, from there we have our day of practice, Amitabha recitation, and、um, so that's it. I mean, if you can sign up, there's also the memorial plaque on the bottom. You see, if you want to join in and put up two memorial plaques, you'll find it there. Anything on the interfaith blood drive you think would be good to say? Yeah, of course. It's still a, a opportunity for those of you who lives in Berkeley or in Bay Area to join our interfaith blood drive, and be together with our good friends, Jewish, Christian, Muslims, and、uh, friends from Vedanta Society. It will be August 10, so you can find the link when you can schedule your appointment. 
appointment and everything is according with all the precautions uh, the pandemic green pandemic is very safe and we hearing uh, again and again how important and is to donate blood and the uh, red cross and a lot of difficulties because of this current difficult year to to serve for everyone who needs the blood mm -hmm. and as we know every two seconds in america the the blood is offered and saved lives and one donation can save up to three lives so it's really matter it's not a small thing so you can still uh, uh, find the slot and, and, and join us. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. Interface blood drive is really a, a wonderful. Uh, we, we've done it. How many? This is our fourth fourth year, I think, mm -hmm. participating. And uh, the Red Cross is so grateful, and they they let you know how much. Uh, that means to donate blood. Well done. Okay, that's our, those are our um, announcements from Berkeley. Sam, anything happening here at uh, GCDR that, for us to know about? We just, we just finished a, a weekend of a thousand Buddhas repentance here at Gold Coast Damarel. Because of the lockdown, uh, everything is going to have to move online. Uh, so we have been transferring merit in an unusual way. Usually we do a traditional, you know, uh, may every living being or Yanitsu Gunda or something. But during the pandemic, um, Buddhists have an answer. We have something that we do that is uniquely ours, and that is Medicine Buddha. Medicine Master Vaiduri Light Tathagata, his, his mantra, he's got a mantra that heals illness. So Medicine Buddha's mantra is here in Sanskrit. And we use this, we, uh, we use the vibrations of the mantra to serve as the vehicle to transfer merit and virtue. So you make a transference as always, however you'd like to do it. And if you'd like to join we use the, the power of Medicine Buddha's vows, which is, that's the whole focus of his practice, is healing illness. So let's send out this energy. And it's, I find this is really good to walk to when I'm not on a Zoom call talking to everybody about the Avatamsaka. When I'm just walking during my day, Om Namo Bhagavate Bhai Sanjya Guru. It's a very nice rhythm to keep the mantra moving and you can just do it on your own. The more you do it, the more efficacious it becomes. Okay, so please make a wish. Here we go. Sajaguru, Paiduriya Prabharajaya, 
More mountains with us next week. Please do join us again. We'll make three bows to the Buddhas here. Make three bows to our teacher. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. See you all next week, everyone. Amitofo, please stay healthy. <laughs>